for the, the they want to start the, the big file meeting because all the equipment was there all they needed was the people so during the Korean War we were making six and eight inch gun tubes in the meantime we were getting a lot of equipment from Germany this was we had teams out there sending this back to the arsenal sending that back to the Air Force you know and um, I was working on a submarine. We had we were centrifugally casting gun tubes. They were doing this in Germany because, like, you get a better structure if you can pour the metal and roll it at a certain speed. All the impurities fall to the inside, and the good metal falls to the outside. Well, I worked there for about a year, and the next thing there, they said. We're sending you to the ceramics. We want you to get a ceramic thing going. So this is how this thing all got in the ceramics. So they sent two people to help me. They they sent me to, the, to start up the ceramic division because they found out that the Germans were using ceramics for molds and small castings. So uh, this is a picture of the ceramic walls and I had two people working with me and these two people they hired them as laborers but they're actually two of the dye makers the both of them this is how they got their help they could get them in as, as laborers once they got them in then they could turn around and develop these different things that they wanted to make and they had the help these two these two guys ended up at Bedford Airfield Machine Shop, both of them. They went to the dye makers. Then after that, we started getting things from Germany. And we found out the Germans were making uh, castings. But they were using what they call a shell mold process. Well, we had machines built that we didn't have because it was up to date, but we had all their lab books so that we knew what they were doing. And what they were doing is, here's a picture here of a, of a shell. The other half of this mold makes the whole mold that the poor Cassidy did. This is made out of sand and phenol formaldehyde eureka, which they use for the dead people. They were using that as the binder. I mean, you'd never think of you doing something like that. And they had trucks, and these trucks would pull up to these shops, make these molds, and then take off again, so that we didn't know how they were doing this. And that's just another uh, thing that was going on there. But uh, the Watertown also, they restarted the centrifugal casting machines. And they got that idea from the Germans, but these were six and eight inch that they were making. But then we found out they were also making 20 and 40 millimeter central casting. And we brought one of those machines to the Watertown Arsenal. And we had an awful time, and we never get it work right for some damn reason. And the next thing I know, I get transferred to a lab. And the thing was to work out, we found out the Germans were making rotating beds on these shelves. And what they were doing is, they were using powdered iron, which they got from Sweden in Norway. And because uh, you couldn't get copper, they could get copper, so they would, and this shows you one of these iron rotating bands on this 8 inch shell. They worked out perfect. But you know, we could have saved a lot of raw material that we needed by using iron particles. But that's what this is all about. And this This is on the testing of the 
nuclear rods, the nuclear shells that we were making, we were making the shells. We were going to Yuma, Arizona to test these shells. Now, uh, this had no charge in it. When we chased it, we were trying to find out just what kind of casing we needed and, and everything else. And this is a picture showing fire it, and way over here you can see the shell. This, this was quite a piece of photography to get this picture. Ready? Okay. These are 8 inch nuclear rods. Now we had we had a lot of problems with the Russians and back some years ago we made a deal with the Russians that the rockets could only go a certain distance. So, the, my name is Daniel Roderick. I graduated from high school in 1940, Sumville High. And uh, I spent six months of the next year. The federal government had this program for high school kids that couldn't get a job. And I was sent to a army uh, place like the hospital for six months and they taught me foundry practice and they taught me um, just about everything when it came to work with uh, metals. Then I went over to the Watertown hospital they said you to go there and they've got a job for you. So when I went there, I said to them, uh, what kind of job? So what I was, I was an iron worker's helper. Works in the, um, the metals building. And when I was there, I, I worked on the um, inspecting welds, um, some assembling parts for the welders, and after that, I, I was, they taught me how to weld, too. They said, well, if you go to several parts, you're going to have to assemble them in what they call tack welding, so that uh, this thing is not one piece, but it needs to be welded. And that would go to the welders, and the welders would, would run this thing. And after that, I was there for... Oh, I would say 19, oh, I think the first part of the first month of 1944 or, or the end of 43. And I went to work one day and my boss said to me, we're going to drive you to an army place in Boston. And what it was, it was a recruiting store. Mm -hmm. It wasn't Winthrop Company, Fort Banks in Winthrop. That's what the name of it. I mean, it's coming back to me. And when I went there, he said, make sure you take your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I never came home. I never had a furlough. They used to give you two weeks furlough when he joined up the army. The next thing, they had me a sandwich. I said, well, I got my lunch. Well, lunch, eat your lunch. And they said there'll be um, a truck waiting for you. And there was three other people. And the next thing we know, we're on our way to South Carolina. No. Infantry training ground. And I never did quit the Arthur, though. So when I did, did come back to the Arthur, well, when I got out of the service, they said to me, you go back to the Arthur and work, because you never quit, or you never resigned, or you never took a furlough. I said, I don't know what the heck happened. All I know is I went here, I didn't get no furlough. And they said to me, um, we got a job for you. So I said, what am I going to do? Well, we're hiring people as laborers right now. We're trying to get skilled people back. So that when they come, now they were talking about the Korean War, and 
They said, we have all the equipment, we have everything, but we have no help. And what we do is we hired people as laborers just to get them. And this was tool and die makers and machinists and just about everything you could think of. Well, they assigned me to the guard now. So I don't know nothing about God. <laughs> so this George Sherman, he was head of the guard in there. And he said to me, I want you to go to the, um, the commander's house. I said, what are we going to do? He said, well, I want you to the Lord. I went there. And when I came back, and I said, ooh, all these beautiful flowers around the house. And I said to him, what do I do with those? Don't touch those. I waited 25 years for them to blossom. Well, we didn't know. The next day, somehow a deer got into the after, and he ate him clean to the ground. <laughs> what can I do? All, all those flowers, you know, they, 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 they were buddy. And he says, I waited 25 years. <laughs> well, the deer ain't clean to the ground. Well, when I went back to the Lord, I said, there's no flowers there. Oh, my God, I thought he was going to have a heart attack. <laughs> you know, but what can you do, you know? Then I worked for the, um, the guard, I think, two or three months, and they said, okay, we're going to revitalize the well shop. We're sending it to the well shop as a welder. And I said, well, I don't know. I said, I need some time. Because I don't think I can weld so the welds will pass x-ray. So he said to me, uh, tell you what we're going to do. We're going to put you in the jig and fiction department as an iron worker. And I spent, oh, some time there. And the next thing I know, uh, I get trained. What we did is we started putting rocket motors on artillery shells. And that was classified 30 years ago. But uh, we had a hell of a time with that. Because if, if the shell would say 10 miles, it now goes 20 miles with the rocket motor on it. Those rocket motors were made out of depleted uranium, so they would disappear. The rocket would fire, and it was disintegrated as it was like burning up. And, and I worked on that project, and God, I worked on so many different projects at the Watertown Arsenal. But I worked on testing a lot of the uh, things that came from Germany. Like uh, these shells, and we had these things here, and oh, there's so many other things. Toward the end of the thing, oh, I worked on high pressure cutting. In other words, we were using a liquid at very high pressures to cut, and it's amazing. We had a, um, some fellow from the state came in and he wanted to know how it worked. He said, you know, that would be great in our fish markets to cut fish because you could cut at a fantastic rate. And I don't know whatever happened to that, but he was in there and, you know, saw that thing. And I worked on another project too, was, um, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, uh, we had we had a project where on the helicopters, the hub, they, they would fall apart. And X-ray, I don't believe in X-ray because X-ray wouldn't find the cracks in the castings. So I went to uh, I went to a place in Connecticut. And the guy said to me, he says, I think I know what you're looking for. I said, I'm looking for an easy way to find cracks and castings. So he says, come with me. I went with him. And they had this long chute. And they had this machine. And this machine had a transducer. I said, what's the rating? He said, well, that's about 40 megahertz. So what they would do is he would fill this up with potatoes. And if potatoes would slide down, and he said, if a potato 
has a crack or a hole, it tears up the the machine. It makes uh, uh, what what do you call it? Um, chips, potato chips, potato chips. Yeah. And he said, this company was in here. We developed this. So he said, well, I brought four casting down. I said, now these pass X-ray. We put them on the sheet, and lo and behold, my new cracks, they were not continuous. This, this is why X-ray, could, it could pick up this crack, but it could pick up the line of cracks. So um, we had to build us a machine. And lo and behold, we had the machine maybe two months. And the hospital from Boston came over. And they said, consolidated, whatever it was, said, you have a machine, which is the first in the New England area, and we'd like to see how it works. I said, uh, I think we're too high in frequency. Well, he said, I talked to the people at Baked Deed, and they made us two transducers, but three and four, the power of them. So he had like uh, a guy put his arm in there, and lo and behold, he could pick up what they were looking for, cancer. Uh -huh. Now, when you go to a hospital now, you see all these machines, ultrasonic machines, that's started with the government. Uh -huh. See, people don't appreciate what was being done at Watertown Arsenal. A lot of stuff, we couldn't say anything, because it was all, we didn't know, you know. But, uh, that's about it. And here I am. <laughs> this is part of a newspaper that the Arsenal used to put out. And this was written by Manny Donabedian. And he's telling you everything right up to date. This is dated. March. March. Um, Monday, March 23rd, 1964. And he wrote it so that you know, this went out to the congressmen and everything, tell them just what was really going on at the Arsenal. And it was a uh, shame. So they didn't come back and they said, we're closing the Arthur part, but we're keeping the research part. So all the people that they wanted, they moved over to the land section, which is, you had the guard house, and then the road went through the middle. Mm -hmm. Everything on this side, they closed. Everything was moved over here. And then after years, they made this still smaller. Because people don't realize and that's when we get into the nuclear route. The government didn't know where they had to have a place to control this. And they figured they had the scientists, we had MIT, and a lot of the people that came to help us were from MIT. And the thing is that uh, that went on for uh, a few years and the next thing I know, they said to me, uh, you know, you, you get, it was over 35 years, and they said, you know, once we get through this project, I don't see any uh, future over here in this lab. He says, the, uh, the government is going to give, on a retirement system, they're going to increase a 5% if you go by a certain date. So I took it. And that, that's how it... Well, you got to tell me your grandson was born. That's what? Oh, what? <laughs> your grandson was born. <laughs> you, you retired when your first grandson was born. Yeah. So, Who was that? That's 31 years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's it. That, that's the whole thing. And you can have all this. Yeah. I get all kinds of accommodations that I got, but it, it's like just once, you know, it just includes me, so... So these are all his years of service. Well, oh, wonderful. Sure, put their eyes up in white.
Here, let's show them oh, better. Boy. Let's see if we can. You'd have to tear them all up. I know. This one I know is watertight last one. After. Yeah. I think you've got 10, 20, 25. That's 35. 30. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. Do you would have a certain number of years at the arsehole. This one here, that says water tile arsehole. I think that was 10 years. And all these others here, some are 35, some are 30, some are, some are 35. But these are all different years. And some are from the Army Materials Research Center. And some are from the laboratory that they broke that down. So you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, here's seven of them. From day one to the day I retired. <coughs> My name is Daniel Roderick. I'm at the Edmund Fowl, Fowl. Fowl House, Watertown, Mass, October 24th. Two